Manchester, 1947, Withington Hospital. My mum gave birth to me on apparently one of the coldest winters in history, November 1947. Um, with regard to the musical background, the answer is no. Absolutely no music in my household whatsoever. Nobody was interested in it. Parents, there's nobody at all. Um, I found my way into music uh, purely because when I was 15 years old, I didn't start playing music until I was, uh, or even any interest in it until I was about 15 years old. I, I hated school. I played football constantly. I, I, there was talking about possibly a career in football and uh, I, I injured myself. In those days, they didn't have, obviously have the sort of same, same sort of medical backup. So in a, in a depression, shall we say, you could, leave, you could leave school when you were 15. So I was uh, 15 on the 26th of November and I think I left school on, it was either the 12th or the 15th of December, being 15 years old, and, and uh, ended up working for Manchester Town Hall, doing accounts for the cleansing department. I remember, and this was again just pure chance, Joe Morello was, uh, obviously Brubeck was in town or Joe Morello was doing one of his clinician tours for Ludwig Drums mm -hmm. and it was at the um, the library theatre and I saw him there play I actually at the same time as well Ed Thigpen mm -hmm. and they they were just fantastic because they weren't like the modern day drum clinic where people thrash around they, they were incredibly educational and they talked about the music and I, it kind of struck a very important sort of note with me. So Morello was a, was a big inspiration, but from Morello, I, at the same time, I was also listening, I, I suppose the most influential musician, if I think about it now, was Shelley Mann. I just loved Shelley Mann's playing. I, I didn't really know who he was, but I remember listening to the Pole Winners albums and all the Barney Kessel stuff and his own band playing at the the, uh, the Black Hawk, I think it was, mm -hmm. and uh, that that was incredibly sort of inspiring. Um, which, reflecting on it now, the music that the, the, the sort of music that drew me into jazz was fairly mainstream. Oh, oh also, yeah, uh, Krupa as well. I've mentioned him before, but um, from there on. I started listening to other things and I remember the first first time somebody said listen to this young kid play and it was Tony Williams and I listened to it and I, I think it was the Miles uh, the live uh, my funny Valentine album and I couldn't understand anything he was doing in relationship to sort of listening to sort of Shelley Mann and and uh, and Joe Morello and the group as the more mainstream players, and and it you know it took me a lot to sort of get into it to start with, but suddenly you start realizing how fantastic this music was, and then I started to go backwards because then I from Tony Williams I started to listen to Philly Joe, which is the wrong way round, and it, but again it's just opening doors for you, you 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 get pointed towards different things, and then from listening to listening to uh, Tony Williams. It was absolutely wonderful that I discovered Elvin, which again, I didn't really understand what I was listening to at the time. It was, it was pretty abstract in terms because I think I came I came into Elvin's music when he was actually doing the the, the live vanguard and it, and when it was all getting a little bit sort of out there, you know, avant-gardish and. I, and once again, I, I, I kind of went back and found Coltrane plays the blues and all that sort of stuff, which then made a lot more sense of what Elvin was doing at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And they they were massively sort of influential into, you know, what I was trying to aspire to. Um, and when I was in New York, obviously I saw some fantastic players and one of my regular haunts and... I didn't really know him as a player at the time, but it was the, 
I was there at the early stages of the uh, Thad Jones Mel Lewis and used to sit uh, a table away from Roland Hanna or Richard Davis and one, one incredible moment I, I remember getting down to the the vanguard and the first the first bass player up was Eddie Gomez who was depping on the first set Ron Carter took over for the second set and then Richard Davis came in for the third set you know, and he's um, watching Mel Lewis work with these play people because he was again, the most incredible player. And the memories of looking, I was always the bass. The bass was by the wall and he had different levels of sellotape where the, the music used to come down because they couldn't get, there wasn't enough room to put the music stand in there. So he put his music up the side of the wall and stuck bits of sellotape on. And, and that was the first time uh, we turned up Roland Hanna was one of my sort of used to love his playing and uh, they says oh there's a, another depth piano player in tonight and somebody said who is it he says I don't know some young kid over there and it turned out to be Chick Career. <laughs> so there was all these most incredible sort of things happening you know and you didn't realize at the time how iconic it really was it was just kind of every day it was like coming to any club and just seeing the locals play. How did you get into Latin music and what are your influences there? Yeah, that's, 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 I've, I've always enjoyed Latin music. Even when I didn't know what I was listening to, there was something about it which I really liked. And the thing on the drum side, I managed to pick up some fantastic bit of vinyl and it, it talked about Latin rhythms and it was a, it, it was a, a guy called Samuelano who is still alive, he's, I think he's about 92, and he still teaches in New York. He used to, recently, I think Sam Ashes closed now, but he was still teaching at Sam Ashes. And this, this vinyl is it's an absolute classic because he just talks about the rhythms and plays and sings. And it was just, it, just inspirational. Yeah, and obviously with being, going to New York we're on the Queen Elizabeth, it was the days of when they used to go down into the Caribbean. They'd, re they'd done a refit on the boat, so they were doing a lot of uh, trips out from New York. And those were the days when, when, when it came into New York. They, they weren't turning around the ship in four to six hours, as they do now, so I believe. We used to get two days, you know, two, three days in New York, which you just used to hang. You know, it was absolutely, because we weren't, didn't have to play. And uh, obviously going down to the Caribbean, I've got fantastic memories of going places like Martinique. And I remember they brought on some local musicians to entertain the uh, the punters. And the drummer got on and he was he was playing some uh, absolutely, it was a battered old snare drum on the wrong side. It was an old military bass, a most incredible groove. And it was just that sort of stuff, it just drew me into the, to, to the music, that was a, that's all. Did you then have to work on that side to learn the Latin rhythms and was it hard work? And you've well, it's, it's quite interesting how, how I've sort of arrived at what I know now because you know, th that was kind of mid to late 60s and then into the 70s, I, I was aware of things happening but I wasn't totally listening to it all the time. Brazilian stuff, yeah. I discovered Aieto, I was more into the Brazilian side. I discovered Aieto about, oh, it'd be in about 1969, 1970. And he became become, again, absolutely inspirational, just watching, listening to what he had, uh, albums like Hands. And uh, just wonderful, uh, wonderful playing. But that was the Brazilian side of it. The Cuban side of it, or New York side of it, I was aware of Mongo Santa Maria, yeah, and uh, all, all the and Tito Puente, but uh, I still didn't go down that sort of stylistic route totally to start with because nobody knew anything about it around here, and a lot of my early percussion as playing congas and playing also a lot of these other instruments was done through playing fusion music. With more coming from like the the the, 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 the Aieto sort of style of it, and believe it or not. Sergio Mendes, you know, because he had uh, Polinio used to play with him in those days, and I didn't know, you know, who Polinio was. He was always aware of this guy who was the most incredible pandero player, because I didn't even know what a pandero was in those days, because 
you didn't have them over here. There wasn't there wasn't a there wasn't a sort of community that played or listened to that sort of music around Manchester at the time. And uh, I started to get more and more into it. And and my biggest inspiration, I suppose, as a player in the 70s, apart from Ayeto, was Ralph MacDonald, who arguably has played on more records than any other percussion player ever. I read somewhere in some article, I don't, you don't know how true these facts are, but at one point he was on 60 of the top 100 albums in Billboard. It was at one moment in time. He was on everything. He played everything. And he wasn't from a Cuban or a Puerto Rican background. He was actually from Trinidad and Tobago. But he lived in New York. His family came to New York. And he was fantastic. And he, obviously he worked with all the, all, all the, all the great singers and uh, um and bands like Tom Scott, and he had a lot of his own albums out, but he was a studio player more than anything. Because, you know, that is so difficult, because I've had so many great musical moments, and so, I, I'm not a sort of musician that you can say, I did this sort of thing, or I, I've done it all, I've worked, I've worked with from, the London Symphony Orchestra, to Dr. John, to Happy Mondays, to Tony Christie, you know, and then all the American sort of jazz people who used to come and sort of tour throughout the UK. You know, it's, it's not even worth going through the list. You play with all those. Sort of, and they were all great moments. So it, it, it's really hard. Um, over the last few years, yeah, I've done lots of films and different things. Uh, still do things like... Angels and Demon, working with Hans Zimmer. Well, he's sat in Hollywood and we're recording in Air Studios. Angels and Demons, uh, uh, with Twilight with Carter Burwell. This, so it, and they're all fantastic experiences. I think the main thing is, you know, because music just comes and goes. And it, you, you live for the moment. When you play, you live for And it's the, it's the best moment in your life that night. And, you know, it's as good as anything that's ever gone before. And you hope you can sort of do that a bit later on, you know, at some other point. But to sort of say, this is this is the gig that kind of did this for me, or this is the gig, that doesn't exist. It really doesn't. Well, it, it is incredibly spiritual. That's the thing, you know. And throughout my sort of lifetime as a musician, you can go any. I've been all over the you know the world several times over, and language isn't a problem. Musical language isn't a problem. Yeah, the spoken languages. I've been with it in the company of so many great players, and we 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 don't even know how to say hello or goodbye. But you sit down and play, and and music's everything. So. It's a, it's just an, just an incredibly powerful thing. It's um, there's nothing better, and and it disturbs me when you know, without getting political, when governments start to try and make cuts around music and things like that, because it it feeds into so much more in life in society. It's it, it, it's the one thing. I mean, if you look at you look at communities from, say, Africa or, 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 or Cuba, all that connection, it's a lifestyle. Music's not something that we do when we've got nothing else to do, when we, when we stop making a living. They, they get up in the morning and it's music. They go to bed at night. People don't switch music off. It's a whole sort of, it's a total lifestyle. And the great thing about music is about communication. So if you can't communicate musically, there's a good chance that you're going to have difficulty in life if you're trying to sort of communicate sort of verbally with other people. The two, so if you learn how to communicate mu musically, then you're, you're going to bring that 
into hopefully into everything else that you do. It's not the other way round because music's it's, it's from it's, it's from day one. We hear it. We hear it in the womb. You know, it's, it's been, I'm sure these sort of stories of people before they're born. You know, they people sense music. So it's just a wonderful thing. And it, this thing about feel and. All this, all these words that people use. No, we, we're de we're dealing with the intangible, aren't we? We can't see it, we can't smell it, we can't touch it. But it's it's like oxygen. If if it isn't there, whatever the situation is, it dies, and it's it's my, it taps you into those those very very special things. And I speak to a lot of people who, you know, various sort of sports clubs that I've been with and you got contact with doctors and lawyers and bankers and the other part of the society and they are so in awe of what we do because sometimes these people have an incredible sort of intelligent intelligence in that the capacity to understand it is wonderful but they don't understand they say musician music somewhere else isn't it you know and and you know you kind of explain to them like yeah, I don't I don't set out to be a musician. I'm just happen to be a musician. I, if if I, I'm lucky. I feel privileged that I've actually been able to make a, a living as a musician because I'd still be doing it if I wasn't being paid for it. But but then you know it's it's it's, it's just it's it's a lifestyle. It, it's, The Manchester scene. There's been many different Manchester scenes. So let's let let's first of all realise that the Manchester scene didn't start from 1975, and it didn't start with Tony Wilson or any of those people. I'm sorry, it was it was something that happened. There was there was sort of social sort of changes happening, and people got together. And okay, that there were certain organisations there that rounded up and they. They made money out of it and people lost money out of it and all that sort of thing. But music, again, is it just reflects social conditions. I Yeah, I was around before that factory thing happened. I was I can remember with being with both hands free when the Sex Pistols arrived in Manchester and all those sort of things. And guys like Martin Hannah, I used to work with Martin Hannah with Spider King in the early 70s. Now, people are sort of talking about them as great visionaries. I'm sorry, they were great guys. We had a fantastic time. But at the moment in time, they weren't visionaries. They were just ordinary guys doing something. It's only later that people say, wasn't that magnificent? How they had that vision to, and, and how it changed society. Don't believe it. It's something that just kind of evolves. It, 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 so the Manchester thing, yeah, it's great. It's, 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 it's wonderful. I, I, I was part of it. I was one of the invisible girls, was, uh, uh, which I, I, just, I, I didn't realise I was one of the invisible girls at the time. But apparently I was one of the invisible girls that we used to, because Martin was a, Martin was a good, good friend of mine. He, and, and again, making great music. Come on, do us a favour. He, he used to call me. I was, I was, yeah, I was a session player. What, and uh, sometimes we used to get criticised for being session players because we wanted to be paid for it. And whilst all these some other 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 individuals were, oh, do it for art's sake. No, no. If you want my time, I, if I'm not doing this, I could be doing something else. And I've, you know, you got a family to feed. But uh, there was you should go in the studio and he'd put something on, and he wouldn't tell you. He'd just say play, and that was it. Now. If you've been a creative musician and you've come from a background and you've listened to creative music, you know what they mean. I didn't come from a from a, an academic background, uh, uh, one from the Royal Northern or, or the Royal Academy, even though I teach there now. And, and so it's, I've always been able to sort of walk into a building, if somebody says play, then you just have the confidence, if you can play the instrument, you just kind of listen to what's going on and hopefully make something fit around what's there. I have some very wonderful memories of the band on the wall. I think what we've got to all realise is things change, people change, organisations change. 
I was part of the band on the wall when Steve and oh, St oh, St Frank. from Frank, Steve and Frank, they they purchased this or whatever they did. We don't want sure at the time, but the venue was here, and it was fantastic because at that moment in time, they, there wasn't the the the, the forty three club had, had gone. Those other clubs that were around in the late fifties, early sixties, they kind of all disappeared. And the band on the wall was an absolutely wonderful meeting place for musicians because it did used to happen. People would finish in town and they would come down here. And, and then because of Steve's, uh, uh, the people that he knew, he, he drew in so many different sort of musical styles. It was fantastic. Whereas if, you were, if you'd have been at the 43 Club when it was open, then it was just purely sort of straight ahead jazz but here it was an incredible eclectic sort of mixture of music and people and 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 it's it's to me it was possibly the first place that i was aware of where different social sort of uh groups met you know because because you used to have the moss side side of it where that used to happen and things in other places but suddenly people were coming in here all, and 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 it, and it was one and it was great it was encouraged the different styles and the blues stuff and all that sort of stuff so in the early days and it was it, it was it was it was wonderful and i knew it used to struggle i think you know like most places uh, you know to, uh, to, to sort of make money and things like that and then in the 80s it, it, uh, there was an injection it's kind of changed it got more educational in the 80s didn't it you know the, or, or i was aware of things being happening here they realised they could t sort of tap into that sort, and that's when we used to do sort of the Monday night Latin things, which started a big scene in Manchester. There was people coming from all over the place to sort of get get the knowledge, whatever the knowledge was, and we were only one step ahead of the audience. You know, if the truth was known, but we we again, it's not. It's, it's a lot of the time. It's not the information that you that's really important. It's the passion of what you're trying to do which is important and it's the energy that you're trying to tap into rather than academic specifics you know what i mean and um it uh, it, it was great and it's it's moved on it's gone i've seen different things happen here i've seen some wonderful artists on here and it's what it is now i you know dare i say i think at the present moment it does not represent the Manchester scene or the Manchester community the way it used to. But perhaps that may be me getting old in the tooth because, we, you know, we're all different. So I, I can understand how things have worked, managements and arts councils and all that sort of stuff. But I, I, do, get, I do get that sometimes, that bit of feedback from people saying, oh, no, it's, things are not what they used to be. But you've got to kind of say, well, things never are. But which I find a real shame, but, but times, things move on. You see, what you've got to realise with teaching, it's, people have always said to me, you know, because I've always, I've, I've always had this sort of passion to sort of teach, even when I was in the very early 20s. And it's not something which you can't, I'm going to be a teacher. You just kind of talk about whatever you do with enthusiasm. And that actually turns you into a teacher in a lot of people. Because if somebody wants some information, again, there's the passion behind it. The, the, the teaching, like in, in, in the unis and the music colleges and all that sort of stuff, if I know I've got to sort of deliver some information, then it inspires you to look even deeper into what you know. And that was kind of the thing that was happening here because when we were doing the Latin stuff and we're talking about claves and all this sort of stuff, and then, you know, there's only so far you can take the first bit. So let's look at a little bit of rumba. And you think, well, you start looking at it and you think, well, yeah, I know a little bit, but wow, I'm going to have to discover a bit more. So it kind of it inspired you to so deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Mm -hmm. My only regret with all this is that because of the way I am, and as a musician, and I've done this and I've done that and all the different stuff, sometimes you don't get deep enough into one specific thing. 
and I know there's musicians out there who passionately believe in one thing, and that's but that ain't that that's not what I do. And one of the old things about being a musician is kind of recognizing where your strengths are and where you're comfortable. And uh, yeah, the, the teaching is it's, it's been incredibly inspirational. Try to teach it, thinking about what to teach, then teaching it because I've met met so many great people down here. Those those days in you know in in the eighties and that. People who are coming into workshops and you're talking to the human beings and it's great and and, and there's so many as I say relationships and you still see them now and you, you talk to them so you can't you can't measure it really can you you know it's life. <laughs>